Hi and welcome to this rendering lecture. My name is Adam Zellerek and I will be talking about Monte Carlo integration. Let's begin with the roadmap. We'll first look at the rectangle rule for numerical integration. You probably already know this quadrature rule from one of the math courses. There are some problems with that rule when we increase the number of dimensions, however, which make it unusable for rendering. That's why we will introduce the Monte Carlo method for integration. We then look at some fundamental properties and learn how to use it in practice. Okay, let's start with the rectangle rule. Here we see a function f of x that we want to integrate numerically between a and b. In other words, we want to compute the area i under the curve. A very rough approximation would be to compute the area of a rectangle with height f of a and width b minus a, which becomes more precise if we subdivide the rectangle into n parts as shown, and quite obviously the accuracy increases while n grows. Delta x equals b minus a over n, and xi are equidistant samples of f in the domain from a to b. Since b minus a over n is independent of i, we can pull it out of the sum. Going to infinity would give us the true value of the integral. That was a one-dimensional function. f depends only on x, not x and y. But it can be easily extended to two dimensions. f now depends on two variables x and y, and we have a volume instead of an area. Before we had rectangles, now we have boxes with equal base rectangles, delta x times delta y, and the height f of x and y, and we have to sum over a 2D array of boxes. Again, going with the number of boxes towards infinity would give us the correct result. That would also work for three and more dimensions. The concept stays the same, but it is harder to imagine. However, there are some unavoidable problems in higher dimensions, like with this eucalyptus forest that saw too many koalas. And in rendering, you have many, many dimensions. So, these are sampling positions for a one-dimensional function. If you keep n the same and go to two dimensions, you see that we have an O n squared algorithm. Going to 3D looks already quite bad. If we have even more dimensions, let's say 20, and that would be quite common in rendering, um, the result is not nice. Okay, Cat, couldn't we just trade computation for precision, increasing delta x, decreasing n? Maybe the accuracy will be enough? Let's check out this example. It's a bit artificial since it's just 1D, but actually it's the exact thing that would happen in higher dimensions. There you have our sampling positions and the corresponding function values. And boxes. Dear cat, we have a problem. Do you see it? Usually some boxes would underestimate and some boxes would overestimate. Here we are quite unlucky and all boxes are underestimating so the result would be also undecimated. That's just by chance. If the face of the function would be slightly different, it would be a bit further to the left or to the right, it might be completely okay, or it might overestimate. This is one form of aliasing, and in the case of rendering, it would uh, hurt one cat's eyes. To be precise, aliasing happens when the sampling frequency is too low that is based on concepts in signal processing. Basically, a sampler in signal processing converts a continuous signal into a discrete one. There is the sampling frequency and the Nyquist frequency, which is half of the sampling frequency. If the signal contains components with a frequency higher than the Nyquist frequency, then there will be artifacts in the discrete signal. This is called aliasing. Now, the function that we want to integrate is the continuous signal, and we process the sampled discrete signal immediately by summing up. 
Nevertheless, aliasing happens, and we would see it in the rendering picture. Hence, uh, the cat's eyes would hurt. A common method to combat aliasing is to apply a low-pass filter before sampling, cutting away the higher frequencies. But that would be non-trivial, actually, and we have a better method. We will describe a better estimator, better for high-dimensional integrals, at least. Monte Carlo integration, or another term would be Monte Carlo estimator for integration. But what's an estimator precisely? I mean, clearly it's estimating something. According to Wikipedia, an estimator is a rule for calculating an estimate of a given quantity based on observed data. For example, the sample mean is a commonly used estimator of the population mean. The rectangle rule we saw before is also an estimator. We might add that most estimators are stochastic variables as well. The rectangle rule one is not stochastic. Uh, what are stochastic variables again? Wikipedia, a variable whose values depend on outcomes of a random phenomena. You probably guessed correctly that we are going random now. In our case, we will make the sampling positions random. And algorithms that use random numbers are often called Monte Carlo algorithms, not only those for integration. The name stems from the casino in Monte Carlo, I guess. Wikipedia gave the example of the sample mean as an estimate for the population mean. When we look at the rectangle rule estimator, we see exactly that. It's actually a mean. Look at it. We can push the B minus A back in to make it even more clear. Here we have it again, the problematic example from before. And we said that equidistant sampling can be a problem. So maybe we can keep the number of samples the same, use the same delta x, but randomize the positions. It looks about right, no? But the cat is critical. Will it actually work? The change in the algorithm is just few lines of code, but mathematically it's something totally different. No guarantees, we might just get a random number. In short, yes, it works. But still, we have to prove it. And, unfortunately, we'll need a bit of statistics for that. If you remember statistics pretty well at TU Wien, that would be the bachelor course Statistik und Wahrscheinlichkeitstheorie, you can skip most of it. Otherwise, fear not, the cat is with you. In daily life, we mostly see discrete randomness. For instance, a coin flip, a toss of a die, the casino, etc. You probably remember that there is a set of possible outcomes, each with a certain probability and probabilities sum up to one. Well, in Monte Carlo integration, we deal mostly with continuous statistics. In this lesson, we will only use continuous. A real life example would be the weight distribution of a cat, described by the probability density function, in short, PDF. The cat's weights probably follow a normal distribution with certain parameters. Another example would be a uniform distribution between A and B. And similarly to the discrete case, the PDF, P integrates to 1. We'll also have to introduce some notation. Capital X denotes a stochastic variable. Small x's are either observations, often with an index variable, or normal variables, that, that is, inside integrals. Then we have functions, f of x. These functions can either eat stochastic variables, producing a new stochastic variable, or just normal variables, observations, or inside integrals. PDFs are also just functions, but with some special conditions. They integrate to 1 and they are positive. Finally, we have estimators which we denote with a hat. And then we have the expectation of a stochastic variable. This is also called expected value or simply the mean or the average. The expectation itself is not a stochastic variable, it's a value. 
given a stochastic variable x, which is distributed according to the PDFP, the expectation, denoted by a capital letter E, is the integral of x times p of x. I took that definition from Wikipedia. The expectation has some properties and laws that we will use in our proof. It is linear, which means that the expectation of a linear combination of stochastic variable is a linear combination of expectations of x. For example, expectation of a times x plus b times x is a times expectation plus b times expectation. a and b are constants here. Then we have the law of the unconscious statistician. The expectation of a function of x is the integral of f of x times p of x. Finally, we need the law of large numbers. It states that the average of observations converges almost surely towards the expectation when increasing the number of samples and all x are independent and identically distributed, in short, iid. id simply means that we don't do anything funny. This law is independent of the PDF of x. The PDF is only taken into account implicitly when used for taking the observations of x. Alrighty, mighty cat, let's look back at our problem from before. There is our estimator, 1 over n times the sum of b minus a times f of x. We saw the uniform distribution already once. Its PDF is 1 over b minus a. We can plug those two friends together. 1 over p replaces the factor b minus a. We removed i here because we want to prove that it is a good estimator. We don't know it yet. And our xi's are observations or samples of a uniform distribution now. Next, we use the law of large numbers. The limits of the average is the expectation. We said that the samples of x are taken from a uniform distribution, so we note that down in here. However, this is not the distribution that was used to apply the law of large numbers. f of x divided by p of x is not distributed uniformly. But it is enough that the samples f over p are independent and identically distributed. Now we have that expectation and we can plug it into the law of the unconscious statistician. The f from the law is f over p and the distribution is uniform. So our result is an integral of f over p times p. And well, the probabilities cancel out and we see that this integral is in fact i. Great, the cat is happy. This is our proof. And here we also see that we can replace the uniform distribution by any other distribution. We'll see shortly how that can benefit us. This is actually quite exciting. The cat is super happy. Ah, wait. What if um, p of x becomes zero? We said that we can replace it by any probability density function. Division by zero is undefined, eh? 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 That's a good catch. And the result of Monte Carlo integration becomes actually wrong when p is zero but f is not. However, our computer program will not produce uh, nouns, meaning not the numbers, as no xi will occur because such x's have a probability of zero and therefore will not be sampled. Still, we have to fix that. And we can do that by requiring that the probability is greater than zero inside the integration domain. In practice, it is enough that p of x is greater than zero whenever f of x is not zero. And here we have it again, the Monte Carlo estimator with all its glory. Appreciate its beauty. All righty, mighty cat, but that's still a bit abstract. Yes, let's look at an practical example. 
Here we go. We are looking at a 2D function. The equation is on the top left. You see a plot of that function on the right. The integration area is a rectangle between minus 1 slash minus 1 and 1.2 slash 1.2, just so its dimensions are not 1 by 1. And we want to integrate it. Here you see an implementation using Python and NumPy. We create n uniformly distributed samples between A and B with probability P. Our samples are then computed with F over P and the average is the estimate. That's all. We can now look at how the estimate behaves when we increase n. With small n, the estimate is imprecise. But when we increase it, the estimate becomes gradually better and better. And it pretty much stops to wiggle around when we further increase n. By the way, here you also see that different runs will produce different curves. Let's try to get more insight into the error. Generally, there are two types of errors for estimators, not only Monte Carlo estimators, but in general. We have bias and we have variance. The rectangle rule estimator has bias, while the Monte Carlo estimator has variance. The wiggling in the previous graphs is the variance of the Monte Carlo estimator. It sometimes produces a larger and sometimes a smaller value. Let's now look at bias. The expectation of biased estimators is not the value that we want to estimate, no matter how large n is. This does not mean that such biased estimators are worse than unbiased ones. The bias can be much smaller than the variance. Unbiased estimators, on the other hand, have a correct expectation. And due to the linearity of the expectation, we can actually compute the average of two estimates and again get an unbiased estimate. And in addition, this new estimate will be more precise than the separate estimates. In practice, it's quite common to trade variance for increased bias, but we won't go there now. Let's look at an example instead. We have the rectangle rule estimator on top, and you see that no matter how often we run it, the result is always the same. Clearly, the variance is zero and the bias is minus 2.301, etc. The Monte Carlo estimator, on the other hand, produces a different result every time. Variance is not zero. We could estimate it by running the estimator many times and uh, using the equations for variance. The bias is zero, as we have proved before. We said that we can improve the estimate by averaging several runs. Let's do that. Here we go sum and divide by 4. The result, 30.885, etc., is more precise than the individual estimates with an error of approximately 1 minus 1.19. Okay, let's look at variance in more detail. There are some important concepts. And then we'll look at important sampling, a way to reduce variance. We see the Monte Carlo estimator on top. We saw that we can run it several times and we could estimate the variance empirically. But we are at an university and we should try to do things more principled. And even if you're not at a university, that's still a good idea. We'll get to that in a second, but we need another short statistics recap before. Variance is the expectation of the quadratic deviation between the stochastic variable and its expectation. You probably know it and uh, Wikipedia also shows uh, us another way to compute it. Um, but yeah, let's leave it at that. Unlike expectation, the variance is not linear, but we can still say something about the variance of a linear combination of stochastic variables. Look at the formula. We can square the constant a and then pull it out. The variance of a sum of stochastic variables is the sum of the variances. That's all we need. Time to plug things together again. That linear combination is quite handy when we look at the estimator. Variance of the estimator, we expand the estimator, square the constant and pull it out, pull out the sum, 
and the variance of f over p is a constant and the sum of n constants is n times the constant and the n cancels out. What remains is that the variance of the estimator i is 1 over n times the variance of a single sample. This is exactly what we saw in the plots of Monte Carlo before. Here I ran the experiments again. In addition to the estimate i, I plotted the standard deviation, which is a linear scale and therefore easier to understand than variance. And yeah, well, it's, it's simply the root of the variance. What's cool here is that we can use all samples to estimate the variance and then we can just scale with n. Rerunning the example gives us a different plot of the estimate, but in both cases it more or less stays within the standard deviation. Here we have the results again. What this tells us is that we can a increase the number of samples and become more and more precise, b we can estimate the error that we are making. Think the following. We could continue sampling until variance is below a certain threshold. In practice, there are some pitfalls, but that approach is used. Maybe something you would want to implement as a bonus task? In the meanwhile, we have that variance, and we want to reduce it, obviously. But first, we have to understand it a bit better. Let's look at this example of a function f of x that we want to integrate using Monte Carlo. We said that we can choose the PDF for our samples x freely. Different choices make life more difficult. Well, well, let's look at this choice. Variance of f over p, right? Here we have a very large f and a very small p. f over p will be very large. Here, on the other hand, our p is large and f very small, so uh, f over p will be something very small. We can do better. Even the uniform distribution would be better. Let's take a look. Here, we now have a larger p, so f over p will be still large but smaller than before. Here, p is still larger, but the difference is smaller. Overall, the variance will be smaller, but you... Overall, the variance will be smaller, but we could find a better p. Look at this. p is still smaller, but it must be if f integrates to something larger than p. This p looks quite good, really. And it is because we defined p as f scaled with a constant s. p needs to integrate to 1, so we can compute s as 1 over the integral of f. Let's look at the variance of an estimator with such a p. We simply plug p into the variance equation and, after cancelling out f over f, arrive at the variance of 1 over s. s is constant, so we have a variance of 0. Variance of 0? That sounds like a perfect estimator. We would need only one sample to estimate i perfectly. That sounds wrong, doesn't it? Well, the thing is that in practice it's not possible to get such a probability density function for non-trivial problems. Start with the fact that computing s would involve the integral of f, which is the problem that we uh, started with. There is an ingenious algorithm that goes into that direction. It's called Metropolis Light Transport and uh, it's based on correlated chains of samples. However, that algorithm has some other problems and it is too complicated for now. Um, instead, we will try to use PDFs that are as close to f as possible. This me method is called importance sampling, because we try to sample important parts of f. We'll see more about that in one of the upcoming lectures. Before that, let's try to understand how to apply Monte Carlo in rendering. In the last lecture, we had those hemispheres and it's not immediately clear how the 1D, 2D stuff that we saw now maps to these hemispheres. Functions on the hemisphere, that might be hard to imagine, it's a bit weird, no? Well, a 2D Cartesian coordinate plane can be seen as a surface in 3D. We call such a surface a 2D manifold in 3D space. 
Locally, you can move in two independent directions. You can do the same on the hemisphere. Locally, you can move in two independent directions. It's just another manifold in space. Let's say we have a point x on that manifold. We can have a function f that assigns a certain value to the point. The pdf is also just a function, so that also works. And we can have different systems to describe the point or its coordinates. For a flat surface, we could have uv coordinates or global x, y, z coordinates or other options. For the hemisphere, we could have two angles, theta and phi, or we could have a local vector x, y, z with a length of one, so that we stay on the manifold, or we could have the origin of the hemisphere and another point in space and define the point by intersection, vector of length one, pretty similar to the second description method actually. This is just to paint a picture. Now for choices of the PDF. For the surface, uniform distribution is often a good choice, but we could also have a linear or Gaussian or even a PDF based on a texture. The choice of important sampling strategy depends on the function that we want to integrate. For the hemisphere, we could have a uniform distribution, we could map a surface to the hemisphere and use that. We could use important sampling of the BRDF, so that's the material, we'll see an example on the next slide, or the cosine, which can be used for diffuse materials to account for the cosine rule. Here we see two different sampling strategies for a BRDF. On top uniform sampling and on the bottom important sampling. The BRDF function along with few samples is visualized in the middle and the result of rendering on the right. We clearly see that important sampling gives us less noise in the result. That's what I showed you in the previous chapter. The PDF is closer to the function that we want to integrate and therefore we have less noise. Right now we will not look further into these important sampling techniques. We have a separate lecture for that. Stay tuned. Uniform sampling of a rectangle is pretty easy. We did it in an example before already. We will try to understand sampling of the hemisphere next and surface mapping kinda happens implicitly when performing a change of variables, like you saw in the lecture about light. Okay, finally, let's try to understand that hemisphere. We have seen that equation before. The result is the light going to the camera. We are integrating over the hemisphere and the function consists of the material BRDF times the incoming light times the cosine. Now we will try to get some intuition on how to perform Monte Carlo integration on it. As said, this function just eats certain values in whatever representation and returns another value. We assume a white diffuse material for now, so the BRDF becomes 1 over pi. Incoming light is computed by tracing rays. These lights are further away, somewhere in the scene, but for the integral that part doesn't matter. So we can assume that they sit right on the surface. And multiplying it with the cosine basically weights the lights depending on uh, theta. Finally, the hemisphere. Well, we can use an analogy of Earth and a 2D map of the continents. Since we only need a hemisphere and not a sphere, we cut it in half. Sorry Australia, there are no kangaroos in Austria. We can describe any point on the upper hemisphere by phi and theta. But be aware, Greenland and Svalbard are way too big on that flat map. They are overrepresented. We can multiply with sine of theta to account for that. And so we arrive at this mapping. Instead of integrating over the hemisphere, we have two integrals now that use a rectangular domain. And we could use uniform sampling of theta and phi for integration, just like before in the example. We compute the integrals separately for free color channels. And this is just to visualize that these are really just 2D functions. So we are computing the volume under these 2D functions. 
In practice, we will not split the integral into theta and phi, but sample the hemisphere directly. That saves us computing sine, and some of the important sampling methods would be difficult in this domain. Now that you understand Monte Carlo integration and the hemisphere, we can finally apply it to compute some nice renderings. We'll start with ambient occlusion, same as in the assignments. You might know this technique from one of the real-time courses. There, you probably computed it in screen space, which is a quicker approximation to the real deal that you will see here. I'll repeat the principle so that everybody is on the same page. Ambient occlusion assumes that light can reach exposed surfaces more easily, and therefore cavities are darker. Think of computing the amount of open sky above a point. There will be less open sky in corners like here and here, and more in uh, exposed points like here, here, and here. We can compute it by integrating the hemisphere and checking outgoing rays. Very often, the length of the ray will be capped. Here is the integral for reflected light. This is not the integral for ambient occlusion yet, but will arrive there shortly. We assume white diffuse material again and replace the incoming light by a shadow ray that gives either 0 or 1, depending on whether the ray hits something or not. We still need the cosine, which is easy to compute using a dot product between omega, the sample direction and the normal. And that's the algorithm. We start at the camera, cast a ray according to the pixel position, finding our first hit point. On that hit point, we evaluate that integral using Monte Carlo. To that end, we generate a sample omega using uniform sampling. Search the internet or check our assignments if you want to know the formula. We then evaluate the function 1 over pi times visibility, which needs a ray cast into the scene, times dot between the normal and omega. Next, we divide by the probability, which is uh, 1 over the surface area, since we do uniform sampling, and the surface of the hemisphere is 2p, according to Wikipedia. And finally, we compute the average of these samples. Here is some pseudocode. When implementing, you can pause or read the slides on the course homepage. Note that for our students, which use Nori, that code is spread over several files and classes. In particular, the loop over n is done globally, while the integrator code will be in separate plugins. The assignment sheets should give enough hints on where to find the relevant parts. The good thing is that these can then be reused for other integrators. Let's now look at direct lighting, or in other words, how to compute soft shadows. Basically, what that does is computing the percentage of visible light for every surface point visible in the camera. It's not that different from the ambient occlusion case, just that we aim for light source surfaces instead of the whole world. We can do that in two ways, either sampling the whole hemisphere or perform a change of uh, variables and sample the light source surface. In the assignments, you can implement both ways. The first way is quite similar to ambient occlusion code-wise, so uh, we'll skip it. For the second way, we have seen all the necessary parts in the lecture about light, but we still need to assemble them. Again, the integral for outgoing light, but there is no surface sampling. Here we have the integral for incoming light with surface sampling and the change of variables, but without the BRDF. Easy enough to plug those two friends together, but something is missing. Can you spot it? I'll give you a few seconds. The visibility term. We need ray tracing to compute it. That's the same, but cosines and distance squared is expanded. And here we have some pseudocode again. That is it for today. Next lecture, we will take a look at the rendering equation, which describes the scattering of light over several bounces. And after that, we'll look at path tracing, the most important rendering algorithm. Take care and see you.